Well, greetings, party enthusiasts. My name is Vicki Soma. This is Teagall 3D. And today's episode, I'm going to call Fun with Gyro Cubes. So a couple videos ago, I did talk about how I was doing a remix of the Gyro Cube models that are up on Thingiverse. So a little bit of background. I was trying to print some of the existing Gyro Cubes that are out there. And, you know, I knew what I was getting into because you could see some of the struggles that people had uh, when they were doing their comments and their makes of these existing models. I didn't think to do this before the printing, but if you take those models and pull it into Simplify 3D and you do the mesh separate connect surfaces, you can rotate the different spheres around and you can get an idea of how those connections are going to be done in real life. So for example, if you looked at the big nippled gyro cube, the one that I remixed, uh, you can actually physically see why people are having problems with the spheres fitting together and why they're saying that they had to shave things off with X-Acto knives or even use a cotter pen to make the spinning work. And similarly, if you looked at the parametric gyro cube, uh, you can see like, oh, there's really not a lot of contact area around uh, the points to keep the points in place, and this would be why people are saying the spheres were popping out. So I used the open SCAD code from the big nipple gyro cube model, and I went ahead and changed up those connections altogether. So I had a female connector and a male connector. I really concentrated a lot on 45 degree angles, you know, just because I wanted to make sure that there was a lot of repeatability. Um, hopefully it would go smooth with the printing process. Uh, in addition, I wanted to make sure that there was a lot of contact areas surrounding um, the connections, so to keep it from popping out, to sort of keep it in place. I was concerned that my version may not spin as freely as the other ones because I was adding a lot of surface area with the connections. Um, so I played around with the clearances and I ended up with using a 0.6 millimeter clearance, which actually is a little bit bigger than the clearances I typically use when I'm slipping in mirrors or when I'm doing moving parts for something that I have printed at Shapeways. Um, but in this case, the 0.6 millimeters uh, seemed like it would be a good magic number and it does, um, it did translate to good spinning. My model, I was originally concentrating on print in place where I would use supports underneath at the bottom um, to hold these inner spheres in. And the advantage was when I was modeling and when I was slicing, I could see those connections and I can see that there's clearances between them. I can see that they weren't going to overlap each other. And in my mind, I thought this would also make it very robust. Like I, I didn't, I wasn't planning on, I wasn't planning on it working for snap in place. You know, I was gonna think like, oh, maybe it'd break if I tried to snap in place. Well, guess what? I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old and they stress test my 3D prints whether I want them to or not. And of course, like little spinning gyro cubes, they were all over it. And so they were playing heavily with these things and the, I was very pleased to see that it survived a number of falls. Um, one day when I think it was the five-year-old, when he chucked it full force against a wall, it survived, actually it was, it was this one that got chucked against the wall. It survived, but some of the cubes popped out of their placements. And I discovered that they popped right back in. So what this opened the door to was, I didn't have to print these as my print in place with the support material. If I could snap these things in, screw the support material. I can save some time and I can save some material. And so now I opened the door for me to try to print it for snap in place where all the spheres were flush like the ones that you see on Thingiverse. And that worked. Every, you know, they snapped in place quite well. So then that opened the door where I could take a look at the slicing and I can notice there was a point in time in each sphere where I could pause the print and insert the inner sphere inside. Like the inner sphere would still fit in and but it would be short enough that the nozzle would not be knocking it as it continued printing. 
So I still have single extruder machines. Yoink, yoink. Put that open the door for me to do multicolored prints. So with this one, I again took advantage of the mesh separated connect surfaces feature in Simplify 3D. So I pulled in my snap in place model. I separated it out so it's five little separate cubes. And then I printed them one at a time in different colors, starting from the smallest to the biggest. And then Simplify 3D again to the rescue. I set up multi-processes. So when I was doing this second yellow sphere, it would print a vast majority of the sphere and then my bed would drop, or in most cases, the nozzle would go up uh, 100 millimeters and it would wait for me to insert that next sphere in. I can start the next process and it would actually seal that sphere in. So I was able to go ahead and do my little multicolored one, which I'm super stoked about. So does that mean, with my snap in place, does that mean that I would never do the print in place ever again and that I wasted all my time? No. One, modeling it that way made sure that I was designing the connections to fit together. And so, you know, I knew what I was getting into connection wise. I could visually see the clearances in the slicing. The print in place model allowed me to show off to my son who loves Pokemon Go. And I was able to do a Pokeball version of the gyro cube that, of course, spins. And what I did here was, this was, trying to get it all back lined up for you. Um, what I did with this version, this was the print in place model. Uh, I printed it upside down in this particular case. And I set up multiple processes in Simplify 3D. So the first 35 millimeters I printed in red. And then I had my nozzle pop up 100 millimeters. Um, it allowed me to do my manual filament switch so I can make sure that the color was coming out okay. And then I had to go back into absolute mode and I had it purge the extruder and start off and it printed another um, 10 millimeters of black. And then at that point, I had the ending script pull the nozzle up off the print 100 millimeters. I did my manual filament switch and then back to absolute mode, extrude, purge the extruder, and then I did the last three, five millimeters of white. Yes, I could do this with the snap and place version. I can do it, uh, you know, but the, the cubes would be not lined up. Um, I could do it as individual prints and embed them in like this. But then that would be what, like 15 different processes. And so for me, you know, 15 different processes, 15 different filament switches. So for me, this is like the less tedious of the versions. It's like just print that extra support material and do the colors and just do the two filament switches total. Between all my experiments, I have printed these models on both the Maker Gear M2 over here and the Wanhao Duplicator i3 back there. I have tried three different nozzle sizes out, a 0 0.35, 0 0.4, and a 0.5. Um, yeah, I'm having a lot of success. I'm feeling confident in the model, so I have uploaded it up to Thingiverse, and it's all like commercial use and all the things that my predecessors had the same kind of lenient license, so go and have fun with it. Uh, the big tip that I would give to you with the printing, uh, no matter if you're doing the print in place or the snap in place or you know however you're doing it, um, you may want to consider doing a vertical Z lift with your retraction. And in Simplify 3D, you can find this under the ooze control settings, and I think it's specifically called vertical lift upon retraction. I, I use one point millimeter. And what this does is every time it's retracting the filament, it's actually pulling the nozzle up as it's moving, as it's traveling from spot to spot. This is good because I have an example of one of my many failed prints here. These inner spheres are really small and really delicate. And uh, when your printer is getting up to this section here where it's closing in the circle cutouts, uh, you can see in the slicing preview, you can see that it's a pretty substantial overhang. Uh, there's going to be drooping, maybe a little bit of curling. And especially in this inner sphere, if your nozzle's coming by and it's hitting this little curled piece up here, it's going to knock it and it doesn't have a lot of leeway. It's going to snap. But if you set that vertical lift, your nozzle is popping up and down for each of these little things 
and it's if, especially if you're printing inside to outside, it's not going to have that kind of collision. It's not going to have that contact. I can't take credit for this tip. Uh, in another gyro cube model that's out there on Thingiverse, uh, this one by Timed Frame, in the description it actually recommended doing this little vertical Z lift and you know that was a nice little trick. It has served me well and hopefully it will serve you well too. Well, that's today's episode. I have had a tremendous amount of fun experimenting with these gyro cubes. Uh, if it's something that intrigues you, I hope you have fun printing them as well. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to share pictures of your prints, I would love to see them. I'm at TJW on Twitter. You can comment down below on YouTube. And my 3D printing blog is at www.tjw.com. Thank you guys for watching, and have a great day.